just to let everyone know we're switching things up here a little bit at sec town talks we'll now be releasing shows on monday so stay tuned on all your favorite channels to look out for us on mondays thank you Hello and welcome again to another episode of Sack Town Talks. Today we got an exciting recall edition show for you today. We have recall expert joining us today, Joshua Spivak. Josh, how's it going? Thanks for joining the program. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, you've been in the, the news and papers quite a bit talking about your new book. Can you kind of tell us a little about yourself and you know how you got into studying recalls? So uh, I've been studying recalls for about 25 years. Uh, when I was doing my master's thesis uh, in history, or when I was looking for a master's thesis, I found a, ta a paper that said uh, that there hadn't been any writing on the recall in about 30 years. It's 25 years. So I said, all right, that seems like a good subject. Uh, of course, somebody wrote a book during that time, but that was years ago. Uh, also, I remembered the 1995 recalls in California and the coverage of that. And if you're a fan of politics, the 1995 event, which there were three recalls and Willie Brown used it to keep power in the, the assembly despite losing, mm -hmm. the Democrats losing for the first time in 25 years, was just an amazing event. Uh, anyone who is a fan of politics would have loved that. Obviously not if you're a Republican, but just as a observer. It was great. And so that that made me interested in the subject. Yeah. So I, I guess for our listeners at home, kind of, can you, I guess, a little background in the history of recalls in California and how they came about to be? OK, so the recall is actually a really old idea. You know, people trace it back to ancient Greece and Rome. And it was uh, in the Massachusetts Bay Colony in a, in a fashion. It was in the Virginia plan in the U.S., in the first draft of the U.S. Constitution, essentially. The Constitution rejected it and it went away. Uh, in the early, in the late 1890s, uh, actually 1889, we've just discovered uh, San Diego actually had it in 1889, uh, at the, the progressive era, they started looking at direct democracy provisions, initiatives, referendums, and there was one, the recall, uh, L.A. adopted it in 1903, a, a um, man named Dr. John Randolph Haynes. He was pushing it as part of this direct legislation league, the Lincoln Re Republican League. And it was this curiosity. Uh, um, Oregon adopted it statewide in 1908, but then there was a real push against the Southern Pacific Railroad. And that's where the recall and the entire direct democracy provision comes forth. Uh, Hiram Johnson runs for governor under the banner of kick the Southern Pacific Railroad out of politics. And the Southern Pacific Railroad, I need to compare it to maybe the entire tech industry, uh, but maybe that's not saying how powerful it is. It was more powerful than that. Uh, it was just an overarching power in, in the government, right. uh, in California life. And so they had by then annoyed enough people that this was the issue. And once he kicked them out, they, once he won, he decided to put forward a whole slew of referenda of uh, different reforms. And the recall was one of those. The recall was actually pretty controversial in terms of using it against judges. That was what the debate was. And uh, but it, in the end, it passed and it passed overwhelmingly. It was actually the one that got the most votes outside of one very minor referendum in that first group of initiatives. Uh, and, you know, it's been here since got 76 percent of the vote in that election. So what, we've had recalls roughly about 120 years. Is that fair to say here in California? Uh, for LA, 120, 118. For California, 110. 1911 was when it was adopted. So I guess, you know, in California, there's there's many different seats, uh, local governments, things like that. I guess, are there different types of recalls and kind of what what is required to, I guess, first initiate a recall and successfully get it to the ballot? So in California, the recalls are very similar. California actually does a really good job with its laws. Other states have real disasters where uh, an official could basically stop a recall by not putting it on the ballot. A city council could do that. Uh, California does a good job. But what California's law is, 
it's this one day, two step process where you uh, have a vote, yes or no, on the candidate and then a replacement vote on the same day. Only Colorado has the same provision on the state level where it's one day, two step, though other states have two day, two step. California has a signature requirement in in the governor. For the governor, it's very low. It's 12 percent of turnout. That's the lowest of any state in the country. And you have 160 days to get those signatures. Uh, For other positions statewide, it it ranges between 10 percent of registered voters for L.A., San Francisco, for the major cities and to like 40 percent. I think it's maybe it's 30 percent for state uh, for smaller cities. And so, you know, that's kind of something we're hearing in the media, crazy California, here they are with another recall. I guess, how many states have recall uh, provisions and kind of what are the differences between the recall provisions in these other states and California? So 41 states have recalls throughout the country on some level. And in fact, the recall is a global phenomenon. It's not just uh, America. Peru is actually the biggest user of recall. And the biggest recall in history maybe was Hugo Chavez in 2004 in Venezuela. So New York, America and California are not really so unusual. Uh, But among those 41 41 states, 19 or 20, Virginia is not totally clear, have recalls for governors, and most of those have recalls for all state officials and all officials throughout the state. Uh, And there's a number of different divisions of how to do it. There's the one-day, two-step process, as I said. There's the two-day, two-step process. And then there's a new election, as you saw in Wisconsin in 2012, where it's just basically, okay, let's do a new election. And then there is another provision that's, I think, eight states have it, Uh, Oregon, most famously, where you replace the person as a matter of law. So if in this case, if uh, Newsom would have been recalled under that law, the lieutenant governor becomes the governor. So there's no replacement race. Interesting. And so I I guess, you know, here we've had the very famous recall in 2003, where Arnold Schwarzenegger kind of came to be elected. And here, you know, nearly what, 17, 18 years later, we have this recall kind of what What's the difference in your sense between this recall and, I guess, recalls in the past? Well, this recall, it actually kind of reminds me of the 2012 recall more than anything in Wisconsin. Uh, This recall feels a bit more partisan. uh, And what's a little odd about it is the state has a very strong partisan lean against the recall. So that's against the the backers of the recall. So that may be a problem for them. Uh, This, there is... Definitely that. And there, there were recalls that were partisan, notably in the 1995 races and uh, 2018. But this one definitely has more of a tinge and it has a specific issue that's a little odd, COVID and uh, the, all the responses to it. But it's different than 2003 in a lot of ways. That one had more of a circus feel in the end. That one had a, an extremely popular broadly popular candidate in Arnold Schwarzenegger running for replacement. And it had a, it came off an election where the governor barely won uh, Gray Davis and won in such a way that if it was a recall, he would have lost. He only got 47% of the vote in that election. Uh, so he was already 3.3% underwater by the time the recall started. Oh, that is interesting. You know, in, in 2003, you know, as, as you noted, there, it was kind of a circus. You had all these big names and notably Arnold Schwarzenegger jump in this race. This time we, we don't have that yet. You know, it is still kind of a circus, you know, I have candidates with bears and things like that. Um, what do you think is different this time? Why don't you think the big names jumped in this time? Well, I think there's a couple of reasons. One, there was a law that said you had to reveal your taxes. In the end, that law was tossed out after the after the finish line, basically, Larry Elder, and it only didn't apply to Larry Elder. He he took a gamble and won uh, by not revealing his taxes. So that may have really limited a lot of the other candidates. Uh, but the bigger problem in terms of real serious candidates was that there was an expectation that Newsom would win. And that probably limited a lot of people who may have taken a chance anyway, especially on the Democratic side. Uh, they decided, hey, you know, I'm not going to really 
go into this and, and risk it. Plus, there's more of a partisan feel and there's maybe more of a partisan feel all over the country. So if you're against this, then you are not a good Democrat. Right. If you're, you're not doing that. So that, that really maybe was a big factor in stopping as big of a circus as it could have been. But I think the taxes really made it, you know, so there were 46 candidates this time. There were 135 last time. I think if it wasn't for the tax reveal, maybe we would have had a lot more social media influencers and the like who could have increased their own, um, yeah. their own personal brand. So we don't have that. Right. You know, interesting in 2003, you know, among the Democratic Party, they ran the campaign. Uh, no on the recall, yes on Bustamante. And that's kind of the famous thing. And they kind of regret that. This year, you know, they're just saying vote no, don't vote on a replacement candidate. Kind of what's what's your opinion on that? And kind of how are you seeing that unfold as the election uh, goes on? Well, I think optically, the way they presented it didn't come out too well, but it was definitely the right strategy. Uh, if you look at the recalls in California, if you look at not only Gray Davis, but the state Senate and state assembly recalls, you see that it does not work to say, OK, they're going to recall them, but then they're going to vote for our side. So in 2003, Gray Davis got 44.6% of the vote. And the Democrats ran a real candidate. Cruz Bustamante was lieutenant governor, twice elected. He was a former speaker of the assembly. He actually did better in the 2002 race than Gray Davis did. And what happens? He gets 31.5% of the vote. The Republicans on yes on Davis had 55.4% 55 55 of the vote voted to remove Davis. But 62.5%, at least, it was probably more if you include all the little votes, voted for Republican candidates. And you see this in all the state Senate races. You see that Josh Newman in 2018 was replaced by a Republican. And the Republicans combined got 58.1%, the same amount that voted to remove them. That in, the, in every removal, essentially the other side wins. You know, it's interesting, you know, in the past, you know, a few years, as you noted, a, a few recalls, it, it seems like the recall is being used more than it has in the past. Is that just something we're sensing or is, there, is this actually a tool kind of being unearthed and being used uh, more vigilantly of late? To some degree, it's true, especially on the state level. Uh, but to another degree, it may not be because uh, we don't have good stats. That's part of the problem. But on the, you know, on the state level, there have been four recalls of governors that have gone to the ballot and a fifth one in 1988 that would have, except he was impeached on the same day in Arizona. Uh, three of those will have been in the 21st century. Only one, 1921, was a governor in North Dakota. That's the only one in the 20th century. Uh, there have been 39 state legislative recalls. 35 of those have been since 1971, and a majority of them have been this century. Uh, of, you know, there's been what, 20, 22 or 21 or 22 this century, 13 in, in, uh, Wisconsin, in Wisconsin in 2011-12. But it just shows that there's been a lot more use on the state level. That said, uh, there, uh, you know, there seems to be basically somewhere near 100 recalls and resignations a year. And that's, that's not changed that much. You know, there was 168 in 2012. So I think when there are more knowledge of a recall, you're going to see more recalls. Uh, so one one fact I like to cite is, uh, you know, how much information was there on recalls before? I don't know, but in since Schwarzenegger, there was a recall. There was a Simpson episode on the recall, and there was a uh, Parks and Recreations episode on the recall. Right. Parks and Recreations is actually set in Indiana, which does not allow recalls. Good. Um, you know, it's something that has been a lot in the news and you're seeing op-eds written, you know, about California needing to change its recall uh, provisions. Kind of what are your thoughts on that? And kind of what changes do you think uh, need to be made, if any? And I'm not sure that it really needs so much change. Uh, part of the reason this one got on, in fact, the only reason really, is that he, they were given an extra 120 days due to COVID. So if they didn't have those extra 120 days, this recall doesn't get to the ballot. Uh, so... We've had two recalls of governors in all this time. We've had eight state legislator, uh, nine state legislative recalls in 111 years, 110 years. 
you know, I'm not sure that so much needs to be changed. The the changes, though, I could see they're worried, one, that it's too easy. So you could just increase the, the signature total. It's very easy to do that. I mean, well, it's not so easy to do it, but that's simple enough, uh, you know, Take it from 12% to 20% or take it to 10% of registered voters. You could also, um, they're worried about the unfairness of somebody, a plurality, that somebody could lose with 49.9% of the vote, as Newsom could, and with 46 people on the ballot, the replacement could get less than 3% and take over the position. Uh, one way to, to solve that maybe is what we've done elsewhere in California, uh, instant runoff. I and mean, that's not so simple, but that's that's some, certainly one way. Another way is allow the candidate to run to replace himself, which feels a little weird. Um, and it actually has happened in, in Massachusetts in 2018. A mayor lost the recall and there was a five candidate run, run replacement race. He won. He replaced himself. So that can happen. Uh, you know, Gray Davis suggested a new election like in Wisconsin. That's that seems reasonable also. You know, none of these are particularly crazy or unreasonable ideas, but uh, I'm not sure that anyone, that there's some grand need to make changes just because there's a recall every so often. Yeah, it's, it's interesting as, you know, about 30 days ago, it looked like, you know, the re the recall and polling was a statistical tie here in California. Now it looks like uh, Governor Newsom has a comfortable lead kind of, what do you attribute kind of, I guess, the changes in the polling and as we're getting close to the election date, this kind of uh, growing sense that, you know, he's not going to be recalled. I think it's mainly people paying attention to it. You know, he has the advantage. The advantage was always there. I don't know why he raced to have the recall now, but uh, I thought he could wait. But there was always this massive Democratic turnout uh, registration advantage. You know, he got 62 percent of the vote. Joe Biden won by 29 percent. They just need to get their people out there and they're going to win. So the more people get focused on it, the better chance he has to win. And I think that's really all the polling is reflecting, right. uh, just more awareness. Uh, and kind of, you know, I, you know, you probably gave it away a little bit, but kind of what's your predict prediction for Tuesday? Uh, you know, how do you think this is going to turn out? And well, I, I could never be sure of anything, so I'm not really much of a prophet on it. Um, you know, the polling is the polling, and it certainly suggests Newsom will win. I'll tell you this stat. That's a good one, I think. Uh, one turnout, people have always expected turnout to go down for this. In fact, in the gubernatorial recalls and in the high-profile mayoral recalls in San Francisco, in Omaha, in Miami-Dade, turnout has gone up in the election. It's spent 2003, much higher turnout than 2002 right. and even than 2006. So that is one factor. Another factor is that in those three gubernatorial elections, the vote kind of mimicked the uh, previous election. So Gray Davis got 47% in 2002 and 44% in 2003, not too far off. Scott Walker got 52 point something percent in 2010. And in 2012, he got 53.1, less than 1% 1 more, but close enough. And in 1921, Lynn Frazier, the, the long ago governor of North Dakota, got 51 to 49. He won in 1920. And 1921, 51 49 again. So it's, you know, it seems to mimic it in these races, not in every recall, but in these. And if that's the case, you know, he has a very nice cushion. Uh, that said, he could do better. You know, he could end up. Uh, improving on his 62%. Right. And, you know, Joshua, if any of our listeners want to uh, kind of read in depth more about this, can you kind of tell us a little bit about your book and what they can expect? Sure. It's uh, thanks. It's uh, called Recall Elections from Alexander Hamilton to Gavin Newsom. It's on Amazon. Uh, buy it for five bucks uh, on uh, Kindle or ebook. And I, I trace the recall, the early history of the recall. Um, I trace all the different permutations, such as what we've been talking about in the law and how it's been used in the judicial decisions and some of the, the more esoteric events. I don't really go into as much depth as I like in, into local recalls. I do list all the stats on the recent recalls. Um, 
But there are some very fascinating ones. The recall was used to fight the KKK in Anaheim in the 20s when the KKK was a serious force in uh, the country. It was used in the Little Rock School Board in 1957, maybe the most important use of the recall in U.S. history. And, uh, you know, go through that and also look. And, uh, you know, I kind of think even though I'm this guy who studies the recall, I don't think it has the impact that people think it does. Uh, the initiative is vastly more important, vastly more powerful, and it's had vastly more of an impact in U.S. history. So I, I acknowledge that. I acknowledge it's uh, that it's to some degree a curiosity. You know, earlier you're talking about how you know the recall was put in to fight the Southern Pacific Railroad, and you know, recently California, we've been trying to build a train. You know, do you think that was a mistake trying to chase the railroads out? <laughs> well. Uh... Oh, it's an interesting question. Uh, I, the Southern Pacific didn't last too long. I mean, well, it actually did last a long time. But um, then again, they, they had a lot of their power was over the farmers. It was really an interesting factor. I mean, we we barely know them today. The only one that we really remember is Stanford, Leland right. Stanford, because of the college. But they were just really powerful uh, and, you know, they, they actually did a lot of good. There's a book that suggests that they did really good things as well, but nobody wants somebody to be totally on top of them. So exactly. Well, Joshua, thank you so much for uh, coming on and, and educating us on the recall. Look forward uh, to reading your book and uh, hopefully the listeners do as well. And if we want to follow you on social media, can you tell us how to do that? Oh, uh, sure. I'm at, uh, well, I have the recall elections blog and I also have Yes, it's at Recall Elections on Twitter. Really, just Recall Elections. So uh, you can check it out there. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Joshua. Have a great weekend, and we'll look forward to the results on Tuesday. You too. Thanks for having me on. Thank